Hello and welcome to part two of our lecture on wild color portraiture in pastel. I'm Michael Northrup, your instructor for this lesson. And we started talking about the paper, the pastels we're going to use, and we reviewed just a little bit about the uh, subject matter we're going to deal with and make, uh, making a good reference. Uh, I didn't really talk a lot about that last time. Actually, the video session got cut off by the computer. So uh, I want to talk just again about making sure that whatever you're working from, whether you're working from life, make sure that that person can always be present when you're painting. Or if you're working from a photograph, make sure that that photograph is clear, it's focused, and it's close up. We are not doing whole body images in this particular exercise. We're only working on portraiture. Now, as I mentioned in the last video, this is not a drawing lecture. This is a painting lecture. So I really don't care how you get your image on there. I don't care if you grid your drawing and then grid your paper and grid up, if you know how to do that. If you have a, a artograph projector or if you can project in some way, that is fine as well. Just a review though, if those are not options for you, just a review about the proportions of the human face. And you can still see some of my marks here. Now, I took us a little ways into the process only because I really want to concentrate just on the wild colors that we're using for the flesh. So uh, at this point, if you can see it here, you'll notice that there's a center line. There are lines that are moving across the image in uh, that are in a little bit of arced form across the face. When we're working with the human face, just the basics, really quickly, there is a circle that represents the cranium, the back of the skull. Uh, this is coming right about here, and it's drawn in on my image because I was working from this photograph of my mother-in-law. And so as you look at this image, you can see the circle. Then you drop down the jawline that connects to the cranium. And so I drop the jawline down here. The next is the eye placement. On average, the eyes are halfway up the skull. So if I'm looking at my own, you know, if I'm getting here a good version here to here. So if I'm looking from the front, from the top here to the bottom of my chin, not this chin, but this chin, um, you are looking at halfway. Now that's an average. And you'll notice that as you're observing people, they don't fit averages. Average means we put everything together. In our society, we find the best looking people are average. And, you know, we think of them as exceptional. Well, they're exceptional only in that only a few people actually land right on the average. Uh, the rest of us are all a little bit exceptional in that we are uh, outliers in some ways. I always say, you think about this in terms of how evolution would take place. If everybody found huge ears attractive, eventually we would have giant ears like this, as they do for breeding dogs when they want to create a Great Dane like I have. Uh, you know, they're always breeding for characteristics and they get bigger and bigger and slobbier, slobbier and slob. You know, my dog has that slobber everywhere in the house. So as humans, we tend to find the most average human the most attractive because that's going to keep us evolving in a way that is uniquely human. Now, this isn't a class on evolution, and if you don't believe in evolution, it has nothing to do with this class, but it's a model that we can look at to understand why there's averages. Now, that's important for you because now you get to understand, if you under know the averages, that somebody's break from the averages when eyes aren't halfway up the skull or when some of these other averages are broken, that makes them unique. And that's what we call a likeness. So that likeness is established when we can compare the model in front of us to the average and then shift that average to fit the model and we come up with a likeness. So that's the first thing I want you to know when I'm telling you about averages. And for example, on my face, 
The left side of my face is slightly smaller than the right side of my face. I do self-portraits all the time. I'm a cheap model. So I know that, for example, my left eye is lower than my right eye, that the right side of my mouth is bigger than my left side, that the same thing is true with my nose, and even my chin is slightly uh, different on each side. So my left side <laughs> is slightly smaller than my right side. Now, you may or may not be a good observer of physical reality. Uh, if you did not see it before, you'll never unsee it. Um, and that's the way it is for me. Uh, you know, I study these things. I don't find that as weird or unattractive. It's just uniquely me. That's how I change from the averages. Now, once you have the eyes, the eye line, which I have described as an arc, because this image is taken from above, the arc of the face is going to be slightly downward curving. I'm looking from above. And so I create that line of the eyes. You can then go from the hairline, this line here, not the line where the bangs fall, but the line of the, where the hair starts, to the eyebrows. And I have a line there, an arc. You take that from the, there to the end of the nose, and I have an arc that's described there, and from the end of the nose to the chin. So from here to here is divided into three equal parts. When you get down from the nose to the chin, again, three equal parts. So from the bottom of the nose to the separation of the lips is one third. The separation of the lips to the top of the chin is one third. And the separation of the chin to the bottom uh, of that bone of, of the uh, mandible here is all one third. So that's the, the vertical, the horizontal proportions rather if you're talking this way, but if we're dividing it on the vertical axis, we're going in thirds. On the, hor you know, it's dividing horizontal axis, uh, on the vertical axis rather with the horizontal um, marks. Now if we go horizontal axis with vertical marks, we're going to use the eye as a, a measurement. And if you're pr looking at a person dead on, the average person has five eyes across. Meaning, if you take one eye width, it's one eye width from the corner of the head that you see to the corner of the eye. Then, of course, the eye is an eye width. One eye width between the eyes, another eye width, and another eye width between, from the corner of the eye to the other side of the head. And again, that's going to differentiate. You have people with really large eyes. They tend to look very innocent and beautiful. We think of them as very childlike because children have much larger eyes. Keep in mind, none of these things pertain to children. Children have completely different proportions. We grow into our eyes. So as children, we have huge eyes and there's just a whole different set of proportions that I want you to think about. But in adult uh, drawing of adults, we want you to look at a average of five eyes. Everything else can be measured in eyes as well. For example, the measurement between the eyes is generally the width of the nose. The mouth lines up with the pupils of the eyes if you're looking straight forward. The ears are roughly from the um, eyebrow line to the nose line. But depending on whether you're looking at me like this, see how my ears look way, like they're way above, I can get them way above my eyes. Or if you're looking like this, they're below my nose. But if you're looking straight on, see if I get this with the camera here. Um, basically, the, you know, they're from my eyebrow line to my nose line. And that's your ears. That's all I'm going to say right now about the portrait drawing aspect of this because we have so much to cover with the actual painting. So that's just a super fast view giving you the ability to refresh or perhaps look up other places on YouTube where you can get a better tutorial on drawing the portrait if that's your goal right now. Once you have your portrait drawn, there's a few other things you need to do to prepare. I need you to understand that we're only going to draw with pastel. I said this in the last video. I'm going to refresh your memory now that we've talked about drawing. 
I use a white pastel and that's because it easily blends in as I paint over it. So as I use the pastels to paint, painting meaning in the loose term, I'm applying great amounts of pigment to the paper and my focus is on color and not line. That's why I don't draw with pastels, I paint with them. But as I begin to paint over the drawing I've made with the white pastel, the white easily disappears. If I use any dark color, it will muck up and muddy up the colors that I'm going to use over top. So white is perfect. It also does not incise like the pencil would. And so if I have a dark pencil line, I can erase it. That's not a problem. But the pressure I've used on that hard point of graphite will create a little ditch in the paper. And when I draw over it, that, that divot, that ditch, is going to remain. And it's going to be problematic for me in the long term. So I want to keep uh, a light touch. I want to draw. And you can see I've gradually drawn the features. I also figured out a few other things. Uh, there's some definitive shadow lines here that I wanted to mark in so that I didn't forget them when I was working later on. Then, after I've got that drawn with the white, I do the background. Always. Please, please, please stick with me here. We are fascinated by the face. We're fascinated especially by the eyes because that's where we focus. But the background is important for setting the stage for what we're doing in the foreground. I don't care what you do for the background, but I have some suggestions. In this case, my mother-in-law, as I said last time, was recovering from surgery. I love this image because she's strong. She's I've got that look on her face like, I've got this. And that's really who she is for her whole life. She has always had it. She's faced tough situations and she has uh, taken it and uh, really mastered each situation. So I wanted to use this, but I don't want a permanent record of a hospital bed. So I wanted just a gradated background and I needed to choose a color. So if you get out your color wheel, you can look at what we call complements, which many of you of course should know. Uh, the idea that we are looking at opposites directly across from each other on the color wheel, they will complement each other when laid side by side. So if I want her skin to really be radiant, if I want her to glow, I need to use the complement in the background. Now you can use it in a, a monochromatic way like I did here, just a tonal change, or you can just incorporate it in the background in different ways to make the flesh uh, more vibrant. In this case, as I look at her flesh, I'm looking at a red-orange, which becomes a peach color, right? And so red-orange, if I'm looking at that on the color wheel, uh, that directly across the complement becomes blue-green. So I selected blue-green pastels that we're going to work, and in this case, I used this one, which is showing pretty well. It's lighter than the bottle green I'm going to use in a minute and much more blue. And this lighter blue green, which is a little more green, to create the light areas. So I was looking here at the image and I want the darkest part of my background to be by the lightest part of her face to again make it glow. And the lightest part against the darkest part of her face, the shadow area, so that that part is well defined and shows forward. So then I create the background. I said in the first video, I don't want you to use your finger and smudge. This is my one exemption. We don't smudge because I want the brilliance of the pastel, those pigment particles to be all different directions so that they're bouncing light all over the place. And I want you to remember this as we go through. Every time you smush this down, it's like taking all these little plates that are in all different directions or little mirrors in all different directions, scattering light all over, and we smush them into one flat plane. And so light can only bounce in one direction and it becomes much less interesting. But when we leave those particles all going in all different directions, then it just sparkles. 
I don't need my background to sparkle. In fact, I want my background to be a background. So it really works well for us to just smooth this out using a rag or using um, a chamois. Now here's something I want you to know. If you happen to have very oily skin, don't use your fingers. And don't do it after you've eaten potato chips. Definitely not after Cheetos. I think we all would be smart enough not to do that. But you do want to remember that oil has acid in it and the acid will degrade your paper and the paper will turn color over time if you get that oil into the paper, which is another reason we don't smudge with our fingers a lot. Especially, again, if you have oily skin, uh, Right now, I'm filming this in the middle of a, the, our pandemic here that we've been going through for a year at this point. And so we're all using alcohol on our hands over and over again. It's not much of a problem, but I want you to be aware of it. The other thing you need to know is that pastel will wash off your hands, but as you get it into your clothes, if it's rubbed in, it also will be kind of difficult. It's a good time to mention this. And before we start with the wild color, which I'm going to do in the third video, I wanted to mention that I did a couple of things here. We always paint from dark to light in any media except watercolor. So that dark to light rule is going to play here, which means that black I'm going to use sparingly, but I can use it to define certain shapes and hold them through the process. So the black is being used almost like a dam to hold back my wild color, keeping the wild color in the flesh areas. It really serves another purpose in the video because the white lines are very hard for you to see. And I have put the black in the dark areas that you see here, just the very darkest, which help you see it uh, through the camera. But I would do this anyway, because the black really helps define the darkest areas. And I'm going from dark to light. So we're going to hold the darks. And that's going to anchor the image until we get together on our next video and start putting in the violet.